Hello, everyone. Uh, good, good evening again in China, but good afternoon in Europe. Yeah. Uh, welcome to this. Actually, I start this uh, webinar series, uh, Risk, Resilience, and uh, Sustainability Informed uh, Integrated Management of Infrastructure Systems. Actually, as uh, you, I'm sure you already know that this uh, webinar series is jointly organized by uh, JCSS, uh, Joint Committee on Structural Safety, uh, GLOBE, this Joint Committee on the GLOBE Consensus and Group uh, Risk Forum Davos, uh, and uh, also Harbin Institute of Technology, HIT, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, SJTU in China, and uh, also Aalborg University in Denmark. Uh, I am uh, Jin Jingqing from uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. On behalf of this uh, organization committee, all of us are here, actually Professor Michael Faber, Professor Dagong Lu and Ming Liu, and uh, Dr. Wei Hen Zhang, Actually, we today we welcome warmly today's speaker, actually Professor uh, Daniel Straub. His topic is, uh, as you already see from the poster, actually his topic is risk-informed approaches for optimizing inspection and maintenance planning of structures and uh, infrastructure systems. Now I take uh, one minute to introduce actually Daniel a little bit. Most of us or all of us already know him very well. Actually, Professor Strauber is the chair for of this uh, engineering risk and reliability analysis group at TU Muhen, this uh, TUM. His uh, interest, research interest, is in developing physics-based stochastic models and methods for the decision support and the safety analysis of engineering systems with a particular focus on Bayesian techniques. Actually, when we want to learn something about uh, Bayesian techniques or RBI, actually his publications are always the popular ones. Uh, Daniel obtained his uh, diploma degree in uh, civil engineering in 2000 and uh, his uh, PhD degree in 2004 from ETH Zurich. Actually, it's a um, pity that uh, I cannot meet him uh, in ETH Zurich when I worked there. Okay. And uh, consequently, he was a postdoc and adjunct faculty at the UC Berkeley before joining this uh, TOM, TU Mühen in 2009. He is also frequently active as a consultant to the industry on reliability and the risk assessments and decision making and the uncertainty actually. Uh, as I know, there are already some software commercially and uh, famous in the field in this uh, Field. He received many awards in the past, actually. Uh, his awards, including this, uh, including uh, this uh, ETH this Silver Medal, the Early Achievement Research Award of uh, IASSAR, and uh, the SAE Ralph H. S. Grant Automotive, Automotive, Automotive sorry, Safety Engineering Award. Yeah, that's all. Now it's time for Daniel. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the very nice and uh, also long introduction. Um, I, that's good. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the topic that you see here today. And yes, I want to clarify that Tom and the Bavaria is not at the center of the world. Uh, just in, the, in this uh, first slide, it appears like that. But we are trying to do our share to make to contribute to this world, and that's uh, why we do this research here. But this is work that is done with uh, many people together. Uh, some input to this presentation, quite some input to this presentation comes from the people listed here, Elizabeth, Antonis, and Hedus. Um, but yeah, in our group, we have more people and many of those contribute in one way or another to what I present here today. Um, the starting point, I show this figure that was prepared by, by Jesus actually, um, that shows some of the major catastrophes that happened caused by deterioration processes in different type of engineering systems uh, with more or less uh, well, large number of fatalities. Um, you should also keep in mind, however, when looking at these accidents uh, that we have Numerous, enormous amount of engineering systems in the world. I mean, it's incredible how much infrastructure we have. And given that, maybe there are not that many failures in the end. You know? So with this you know, catastrophes and failures that we see, for sure, are things that are 
not nice. But this is only the one side. The other side is that we actually spend very large amounts of resources, money to prevent these events. So it's, there's some estimates that three to 4% of GDP alone is spent on, on preventing uh, corrosion damages. So this is the background. And I was asked to talk about risk informed or planning yeah. of inspection and maintenance today. And so I'll show you this slide, which shows the risk idea. Uh, very basic, and I think everybody has seen things like that before. But this shows the, where the risk comes in. So essentially, when we maintain our engineering systems, we can do more or less. And this is reflected by this blue curve here that shows, okay, we can, we can spend more resources or less resources to maintain. And if we do that properly, we'll get, with increasing resources spent, also an increasing reliability. And that in turn will reduce the number of failures, hence the risk, the red curve. And then we can find some optimal level of reliability, which correspond to the one where we minimize in some sense expected resources or expected cost. We then also might have a acceptance criteria so as a minimum level of, of, of reliability that we require, a maximum level of risk that we, we can accept. And we have to ensure that we, we comply with that. Okay. So, well, if it's that easy, then why do we need 45 minutes to talk about that? Well, of course, this is a very high level picture. And, and now we'll actually go into the details of how, what is behind the blue curve mainly. So I'm not talking much about the risk, because the risk is part of all this, but I'll look more into the blue curve. How are we going to do optimal maintenance planning? Now, when we look about maintenance planning, um, we can differentiate different approaches to maintenance. In particular, we, we differentiate between corrective and preventive maintenance. And I'm not going to talk about corrective today, which is basically what you do with a light bulb. Uh, you just wait until it fails and you replace it, which you can do for low consequence failure type of failure, yeah, processes. But I'm going to focus on preventive today. Now, we distinguish furthermore between three types of preventive. One is systematic. You just replace or you do some maintenance at regular time intervals. Um, again, that's simple and it's quite effective in many cases, but it's still not as optimal. This is not as optimal as the one on the, on the, two, the two approaches on the right. It's simpler, but less optimized. So I'm going to look at the two approaches on the right here. You see the condition-based or predictive. The difference between these two is that in the condition-based, I do inspections, maybe I have monitoring systems, and I use directly the information from this inspection and monitoring system to decide on what, maintenance actions I'm going to do. In the predictive, I'm using additionally a predictive model that maybe tries to predict how will the deterioration go on in the future? What, how will the, maybe the reliability evolve in the future? And use this additional information to determine the maintenance actions. All right. Now, when we look at this from a point of view of decision theory, um, we can draw these nice decision trees. And this decision tree here kind of shows the idea for, for, for a single structure or system. Not that we have decision deterioration processes, and the fact that we have multiple branches here means that you know, this deterioration process is stochastic. It can go in many different directions. The fact that it's bold here indicates that we have many components that can deteriorate. So this leads to a certain system condition and if we think of reliability, this is either safe or failed. If it's, it hasn't failed yet, then we basically can do decide to collect information, do an inspection, do different types of inspections. We get outcomes from that. These are again, different type of possible outcomes. Based on these outcomes, we might decide to repair or not, so different type of repairs, replacements. 
And then it goes on, the duration process, process continues again stochastic and the whole thing repeats in the, in the next time interval and so on. So this is a decision tree that kind of already shows the possible, the complexity of this whole thing. Now to populate this decision tree, I'm just quickly going to through what we need to actually quantify the, this type of model. We need, first of all, iteration models, stochastic iteration models that reflect the uncertainty that we have in the uncertain, in the end, in, in the iteration. Now for certain type of iteration mechanisms, we do have models. For example, for fatigue, we have relatively well-established models. For example, more like empirics-based models that are based on so-called SN curves shown on the left, or also fracture mechanics-based models that are a bit more physical, um, which is kind of a figure that indicates that on the right. These are relatively well-established models, but even for fatigue, still, when we look at really predicting not in the lab, but in the real structure, the performance, I must say that we still have relatively poor models, but for sure they are stochastic. You know? An alternative is, which in some cases can be developed, in particular now we have more opportunities to do that, is to use well, data-driven models. Uh, learn, here's a mod, machine learning based model of um, predict, trying to predict the failure rate of uh, gas distribution pipes. What you see here is that the, the orange is are actually observed failures and the blue are components that did not fail. And on the horizontal axis is the predicted failure rate. And ideally we have a predicted failure rate that is much higher for the orange ones than for the blue ones. Actually, this doesn't look that good, but actually this model performs pretty well um, because the bulk of the bulk of uh, data is here. Um, but yeah, these models are cannot be perfect. Um, so in some cases we might have data and they allow us to learn these models. Still stochastic. Okay, Oops, sorry. Now, the, the second step that we need in the second model type that we need in quantifying this decision problem is a model of the data collection. So the model of inspection and monitoring. Uh, mathematically, I mean, you mentioned uh, that I like Bayesian analysis and um, the way this is done in Bayesian analysis and well, generally in statistics is we describe this by likelihood functions. A likelihood function is a function that is written here that is basically the, the probability of making a certain observation, a data point, given the value of my I'm fixing the, the, the parameter of my model that I want to learn. So in the, an example is the probability of detection curve, which is shown here on the right. This is the PLD curve, which gives the probability of detecting a defect in function or conditional on its size. So when, of course, the larger the defect, the more likely this is to detect. But even the large defect has a certain probability here of not being detected. This we take into account. So this is models that we need, which we sometimes have available, not always. Okay. Another thing that we need, another ingredient, is we need typically reliability analysis because we need we often typically we deal with high consequence, low probability events, which means rare events. So actually here we have probabilities of ten. Sorry, one percent, which is pretty high already, yeah, which is okay for certain type of infrastructures. Um, but of course, for a bridge, one percent probability of failure would be too high. You can imagine. Um, anyway, we want to be able to calculate this, and we need specific we need methods that can deal with this. Um, and in particular, we also, at least for some approaches, not for all, but for some approaches that we use, we also need methods that can do conditional reliability analysis. So reliability conditional on observed data. Um, so here you see how the unconditional reliability, which is the dashed line, changes when I do inspections of an element, assuming these inspections give good results, or if I do inspections of four elements. 
in this particular system. Um, if these inspections show good results, that means the reliability is increased, the probability of failure decreases. And I can quantify that using reliability analysis. Okay, these are things I'm not going to talk about uh, much, but these are things we need also. And there are methods available for that. Now, we put all this in an environment, just to clarify that, that stochastically simulates, in some sense, the entire lifetime of the system. So people who work with monitoring, as a gem in particular, structural health monitoring, um, they're used to, okay, we, 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 we get data from our system, and then we analyze the data, we try to predict what's going on with the structure, and we feed that back, and then we decide on actions. Now, when we do the planning of maintenance alone, that, that's okay, that's what we can do. But when we do the planning of inspection and maintenance, so we also do the inspection and monitoring planning, then we have to make everything digital. So we also have to create a digital twin of our monitoring inspection. So that means we, we make a, digital twin, which kind of simulates the, the operation, including all the environmental condition, the, the duration processes, they are here, um, included in our model, now, nowadays called digital twin. Um, and with this, we simulate our SHM or inspection outcomes. Yeah. And then we use these simulated inspection outcomes in another model that might be just in the same basic model, but now we, we kind of first create a, a virtual ground true, and then we use this virtual ground true here to update our model, assuming that we have we don't have the virtual ground true. We only have the inspection data that comes out of this virtual ground true, which is not you know realize the inspection data is not telling us the full truth. Remember the POD. Yeah, so we, it doesn't tell us whether there's a crack or not. It just tells us maybe there's a crack if we, if we are lucky to find it. Okay. And then it goes feeds, then it feeds back. See, this is then like in a real system used to decide upon the actions. These actions then feed back into the into the model of the underlying model. So we run kind of two models in parallel. One is the one that is some kind of fake ground truth. And the other one is what we actually will, we will know when we run the real system. Okay, so now we go back to our decision tree and we look at the decisions that have to be taken. Now we just need to introduce these terms here. At every point where we do a decision, this decision can be described by a policy. Now a policy is just a, a kind of a decision rule that says, based on what you have observed, we will do this. So if I, for example, a, a simple policy would be, if I, be, if I find a, a, a crack, a fatigue crack, I repair. If I don't find a fatigue crack, I don't repair. But of course, this is in a very simple case. If you think of a system where you can have many different observations at the same time, these policies can become very complex. But this is a policy. For each decision, we have such a policy. And the set of all these policies we call strategy. And this is what we want to optimize. Now, one, just to show one example here, this would be kind of a possible you know, history, what could happen. First year, do nothing. Then in year three, we do some visual inspections. Maybe find nothing. And then in year 15, we repair component A. Or in year five, we inspect and repair component one already. Then in year 10, we do some visual inspections of other components and so on. So there is a, a very large number. I mean, for, for a particular example, of course, this depends on the example, but in the, it's 10 to the power of 73 written here. Um, but there are a very large number of decisions and event paths that we can take. And uh, we're trying to find the optimal one, um, or, or most like, more precisely, we're trying to find the optimal strategy, so that the set of policies that 
gives us in the end the, the lowest expected total life cycle cost. So S is the strategy. And we're trying to find the one that minimizes the expected life total life cycle cost, but the expectation is actually over the, the set of observations set. Um, these are all the possible observations you can make. Now, the space of observations itself actually depends on the strategy because the strategy tells us whether we expect or not. So, so mathematically, it's not that trivial. Okay. Now, here is the complexity is written. You see it's exponentially with time and, and number of components. It's also polynomial with the number of the space of, of observations. So it's it's Basically, intractable to find an exact solution is essentially intractable for real life problems. And um, at least for general real life problems. The fact is, there are solutions for special cases, but not in the general case. So, there are essentially three different types of approaches that one could can use to deal with this issue. Uh, one is called partially observable Markov indecision processes. The second one is reinforcement learning. And with the advent of, of all these machine learning techniques, um, this is becoming more and more popular, so particularly deep reinforcement learning. Um, and the third approach is the one I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's possible to combine these approaches. In particular, reinforcement learning can be combined both with PMDP, but also with heuristic approaches. Uh, this is something we're also working on. But I'm going to talk about heuristic approaches because I feel that they are the most easy um, and they have many benefits. And that's why I would like to kind of promote them also. But yeah, of course, particular reinforcement learning also has quite some has a potential and is currently on vogue. Now, what is the idea of the heuristic approach? The idea is that we think of this set of all possible strategies. Remember, it's 10 to the power of 73. So we have this very large space. And, but instead of considering all these options, we are trying to find a subset of these that we can describe by parametric heuristics. I'm going to make examples so that you understand what it is. And we're going to search only in this subspace. Um, it's the one thing which is called tariff policy search. Um, so examples, actually, I'm going to make the next slide to show some examples for what is such a heuristic. So and these are things that are around for 40 years. So not before I was born, almost before I was born. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not, uh, this was not invented by me, just to be clear. Um, So one such a heuristic is, for example, the threshold, what I call the threshold heuristic. Um, so a lot of people call this the, 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 the threshold approach. Um, so basically what we have is that this is for a single component. Right? For, for, a, for a single component, we want to identify the optimal times of inspection. We say, okay, we always perform inspections when the probability of failure of my, my system or component exceeds a certain threshold. So we see here the probability of failure increases with time, and then it crosses this threshold, or it would cross this threshold. So we perform an inspection. And then we get some result. In this case, we get you know, the reliability is increased. So we then do again the inspection. And we then wait again, do the inspection. Uh, next time we could cross the threshold and so on. And then we can move the threshold and this is my parameter of the heuristic. So this is a parameter. And I can, by moving the, the threshold, I will get different inspection types. Even simpler heuristic would be to just fix the inspection times. So, okay, every five years, every 10 years. Now, in this case, we replace this. This is a simple problem because it's just a single component. But even here, we have two to the power of T alternatives for how we do these inspections. And now we just need to optimize one parameter, either the threshold or the interval between inspection time. So 
it's a much simpler problem. And this has been used, as I said, in the past. Uh, many people, in particular also Michael, has worked a lot on it. Um, and he brought me also to this field. Um, so this is something that has been around, but we realize that, of course, these, are, these heuristics are, 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 are suboptimal. Um, because they are here, they are not covering the full, or not covering all possible strategies. But for these simple problems, like the one I showed, a simple inspection of a single component, um, we find that they are not that suboptimal. Uh, so this is a comparison we did, but other people also did some comparison like that. And it shows the expected cost we get by changing the, using the periodic inspection heuristic. Um, and depending on the number of inspections that we do over the lifetime, this is the total expected cost. We see that we touch closely, we almost reach the optimum value. This is the kind of reference solution is the dashed line. If you do the reliability threshold, and this is in terms of the reliability index here, not the probability of failure, um, then we also, if we chose the optimal point, we also get almost to the reference solution. Uh, other people have found bigger differences. Uh, well, some people found similar results, other people found also bigger differences, depend on the case. You can surely find the cases where these simple heuristics are not the best. For example, if the inspections perform badly. But um, in overall, if you find a good heuristic, you get results that are not that far from what you get with other approaches. Um, so we reduce the space of this large intractable space of all possible policies and strategies um, to just searching among a few heuristic parameters, which we call W. And, we, and then we still have the complexity of the, um, basically all the possible, I mean, the stochastic space of the deterioration and the system model, which if you consider a system, infrastructure system, structural system is a large, this can now be handled by a basic Monte Carlo approaches. And I'm going to illustrate that now. Um, and these are insensitive to the problem size. It makes them quite attractive to use for large systems. So I'm going to illustrate that again. I'm going to say that on a very basic example, um, just so that it becomes clear of what we're doing. But it's kind of straightforward to transfer that to to actual larger systems. It's just more difficult to show anything. And I use that now. I did this in the context of another of another um, seminar to determine the value of information of a monitoring system. So here I'm even looking at the very simple decision, namely whether should whether we should install a monitoring system or not. Um, so this is just a toy example. So we use a gamma process to describe the duration. Failure occurs when this process reaches one. We can only replace, that's the only maintenance strategy that we have. And then there are some costs. Assume discount rate and so on. Now, you could think of different heuristics, just three of them are mentioned here. For example, whenever the mean damage, the predicted mean damage exceeds a threshold, perform a repair. Whenever the failure rate estimated seats of threshold perform an inspection. And if that shows bad condition, perform a replacement. So different things are possible. I'm going to look at this one, which is, I said, what if, what if we install a monitoring system that gives us a damage estimate at each point in, at different points in time. And when this damage estimates exceeds a threshold, perform a repair. And I want to know what is the associated Expected life cycle cost with this particular associated with this particular heuristic. So in step one, I actually generate Monte Carlo samples of my deterioration process in the order of what we do typically in our applications is in the order of 10 to hundreds. 
uh, sorry, not ten thousand, hundreds to thousands. Sorry. So in this case, I do one thousand. I plot one hundred, but I do one thousand uh, simulations. These are the trajectories that I generate. And the second step, I generate the observations I, I would make with this strategy. So with this strategy, the observations I would make come from the monitoring system. And this gives me an observation at each discrete time step. And these are, you see here, these noisy kind of measurements of my deterioration. And this is one trajectory. And, and I do this for every trajectory that I generated here. So for each trajectory, I generate an outcome of my monitoring system. This is for another trajectory. This is for another trajectory. So remember the, what I showed you earlier, this, this figure where I showed this digital twin, where I had the kind of two models. So the blue line here corresponds to my ground truth model. That's kind of how I model the future ground truth. And the red dots or orange, crosses, not crosses, the orange crosses that you see here, they are the, what I, the observations I get. And from these observations, I could, I can create my second model. I could, for example, now do a Bayesian updating with these crosses and use these crosses to predict what is the, the, the growth here. And this is, we do that, but in this example, I'm not even doing that. I'm even skipping the Bayesian updating here. To make it even simple. Okay. So I have this generated these different trajectories and I get this inspection result or monitoring result. First step, I apply the, 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 the heuristics on the um, maintenance action. And that's the way, as we said before, simple. We replace the system if the observed damage is larger than a threshold. And for a particular threshold, a near optimal threshold here. Um, this is the green threshold that you see here. So for this particular realization of the ground truth and the corresponding monitoring outcomes, I would replace at T equals 8.9 because that's the first time I'm crossing the green line. Okay. Now, it's clear that this is not this is not fully optimal. Huh? So we could do better. For so example, we could just do better by saying, okay, let's learn from the let's learn from the orange dots a model first. And then instead of using directly the measurements, because the measurements are quite noisy, as you can see. So even just doing kind of a moving average approach would maybe probably be better. But well, if we want, we could do this very simple heuristic. And this will give us this. That for this particular realization, we would replace at 8.9, and it would be before we have failure. You see, failure actually never happens for this particular realization because the blue line never crosses the, the one. But this realization, the blue line crosses one, so this realization would fail. But luckily, in our with our heuristic, we would replace the structure before it fails. So quite actually quite close to the failure. So pretty good. And so on. So we do that for all the, the, the trajectories and we get these trajectories. And you see that some of them would not be replaced on time and they would fail. So these are the ones that cross here. So we would have some failures. Now in this example, we can live with some failures. Um, of course, we ideally would prevent all of them, but yeah. And we can now calculate what is the, the cost and the expected cost and the expected failure cost or the risk that we have by just taking from each trajectory all the costs associated with whether we do replacement or not and we see whether it has failed or not that gives us these two things the risk here the expected failure cost and the Benefit. The benefit is basically associated with the, the system running because the, each time instance the system works, we have a benefit. And then, so again, we have an expected utility or expected, yeah, expected utility. Um, that's the difference between benefit and, and risk. 
But now in this case, we want to know the value of information. We can compare that with the, with the other strategy, which is to not do, to basically not collect any information. And if you don't collect any information, then we actually have a very simple problem because then we can only a priori decide when to replace. Yeah? Then we have a corrective maintenance strategy. So the right is a corrective maintenance strategy where we just choose the optimal time to replace without having any information. And that we can also simulate in the same way. But we lose out a lot of benefit here. And we also have some things here. So, so this is this performs worse than this. And the difference between these two actually is the value of information. Now, what you can see is that this is the Monte Carlo uncertainty. With uh, 1,000 samples, we get a very good estimate. Um, so we don't necessarily need a lot of samples, but I'm going to talk about this. We might need a bit more, it might be a bit more difficult if we have problems where the consequences of failure are larger. So we have high consequence failures. And here, consequences are high, but not that high. Okay. So this approach is very simple. It's quite intuitive because you know we can do this in Monte Carlo simulations. It's really very intuitive. And um, yeah, it's uh, this is the Monte Carlo estimate. You just need to do these trajectories and take the average of this. This is an unbiased estimator. Even we can we can also get its vary its variance. So we we have a, an idea of how good we are. But we realize that 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 if we don't use enough samples, we will also realize that. So that's pretty good features. Of course, we still need we still need the challenge of finding good heuristics, um, which is simple for a single component, but maybe not so simple for a system. Ideally, these good heuristics are what I tried to explain, are using a prediction model, which means that inside this Monte Carlo simulation, we need a prediction model. So we need a second digital twin inside the Monte Carlo. So for each Monte Carlo run, we need to actually um, run our prediction model. For example, we need to run a Bayesian analysis and that's computationally more costly. And if we have small probability high consequence type of failures, Monte Carlo error can actually be large and we need additional techniques, but we have some ideas for what to do with that. Now, I'm going to show one application case where we address these challenges. And uh, I, I'm not sure I have time. I have a second one, but probably I don't have time for that. But I will, let's see, I will show the first one. Um, and this is where we use dynamic page networks as a tool actually to to, to, to address these challenges that I show here. The application case is structural, where we have you know, many components. Um, and we could, you know, these components are subject to fatigue deterioration. And, you know, we have to somehow choose which component to inspect and uh, when to inspect and also how. Now, this the heuristic that we propose here, and it can be, of course, always modified and, and changed if people have better ideas, but um, is that we perform inspection campaigns at fixed time intervals, which also has some advantages in practical purposes for practical reasons, because that makes planning easier for the company. This delta T, however, is, a, is an optimization parameter, a heuristic parameter. Then we also do additional inspection campaigns if for some reason the system failure probability exceeds a threshold. So to make sure also that we comply with reliability requirements. And then at each campaign, we inspect NI components. This NI again is a, can be optimized, actually is optimized. So how many components to inspect? And then we need to decide which components to inspect. And for that, we proposed some priority index which basically considers the, the structural importance of each component, as well as the probability of failure of each component. Because the, the structural importance is clear, the more important the component, the more likely it has a consequence if this component fails. And the probability of failure of the component is because uh, when I 
expect a probability a component with higher probability of failure, I actually learn more, not just about this particular component, but also about the rest of the components. So we have, we have shown actually in much earlier studies uh, together with Michael, that if you, if you inspect components with higher probability of failure, you can learn not more about all the other components in the system. Because uh, you're you're more likely to to get information from that. Anyway, so these are the, the these are the, 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 the heuristics. So we, this is how we choose, and we have four parameters that that this heuristic requires, um, and we then optimize these parameters. But in the first, but first we we need to calculate um, the Bayesian net the, the reliability. Um, in, uh, for two reasons. The first one is that the, 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 the heuristic itself requires us to have a model or a, a model that gives reliability as an output. Remember here, we need the probability of failure that we estimate based on our simulated inspection data. So this is something we need to calculate many times because we do this in the Monte Carlo simulation, so hundreds of times. But also because the system is actually highly structured, it's highly reliable. So if we would just do Monte Carlo sampling of the failure of the structure, we might in, in 100 or 1000 samples, might not even observe a failure. So what we need is to calculate conditional probability of failure of the structure. And um, now, the, how does the Bayesian network work? Well, this is not a presentation about Bayesian networks, but just to, to, to clarify here, that we have this network that represents different random variables at different points in time. Um, and the links, in some sense, reflect causal dependence or at least the, the, the dependent, it's a reflect the dependent structure among them. Uh, so we have different time steps. We also have different components here ordered. And these are dependent. And this, this alpha here reflects that different components have a dependence. Uh, so they are not independent. We can we, we do consider that this dependence between components, which comes from common influencing factors, mostly. Same load, same environment. Okay, we have the deterioration state that we model. We have parameters of the deterioration model that are time independent, for example, material parameters. And we have um, parameters of the deterioration model that are time dependent. For example, loads could be time dependent. Um, and then we have inspection and monitoring outcomes that could be both on deterioration itself, like we try to inspect and see if there is a defect. But we can also monitor um, the, for example, the load. So we could monitor, maybe monitor some um, material characteristics. So all this can be included. And then we predict at every point in time for every component, the condition of the component and summarizing the component conditions, we get the system condition. And the network is relatively, okay, if the structure, is uh, like the way the, the way it is here, and we have certain properties of the problem. So this is not suitable for all problems, but if we have a certain properties of the problem, it can be very efficient in computing conditional reliability estimates. So what we get out of this is that we can give in the inspection history, which we have simulated using our models. And then we get from the Bayesian network outputs like the one here, where you see the component probability of failure for different components at different points in time. And you see initially all the components, this example, all the components have the same reliability, but then once you start doing inspections, the components start to have different reliability. And we also get the system probability of failure that is shown on the right. And here you see this dashed line that indicates that here a maintenance action is performed, okay? because we exceed the, the threshold for, we exceed some thresholds and maintenance action is performed. Okay, so this is relatively done relatively efficiently. 
with this. And then with, with one, this is one inspection history and we then get the costs associated with that one inspection history. So we get both the failure risk. So here we have actually a low failure risk, which is very low for this particular example. The component repair costs, the inspection costs, both we have a cost for the inspection campaign and the cost for the individual inspection. So these are all costs that we have written a large repair cost. So for one history, one trajectory of the inspection history. And then we do that for many such histories. Again, remember 100 to maybe 1,000 of the final histories. And we then get the average costs among these histories. And then it looks something more smooth, like here, where we get the risk, component repair, component inspection, inspection campaign costs shown in function of time. So the fact that you have a low probability, you see the probability of system failure is 10 to minus five, is dealt with here by the fact that we, using the Bayesian network, we can compute for each trajectory directly the risk, you know, the, the probability of failure. And so we don't have, the, we don't need to, need to observe in our simulation failures because we get the conditional probability of failure, conditional of the inspection result. So that's the trick to not having to do 1 million Monte Carlo steps. Okay. And finally, we have to find the optimal strategy. So we have these four parameters, which means that we, 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 we basically repeat this process for different choices of these parameters. And not to have, now it's getting a bit expensive computationally, so not to have to do that too, too often. We do, we do some different, yeah, different ways of doing a smart optimization over these. One thing is to use a Gaussian process regression, we also use cross entropy optimization to find the optimal choice of these parameters, which for this particular example was shown here. All right. Um, yeah, I have a second example that would be coming now, but I'm looking at the time. So I think I have used my time more or less, correct? I'm looking at the organizer. Uh, Danny, you have uh, some minutes more, if you like. Um, okay, you have okay 10 I minutes. will do it. Yeah. 10 minutes more. Okay, good. Now I will do it. I will try to do it in five minutes. Or two. <laughs> okay, thanks. I will do that. In, so I just want to show that this is a different application where you've it's a different approach to basically address these. So it's still the, this heuristic approach, but now kind of we focus on, on different aspects and, and just to show that we can also use different approaches to, to compute this different, uh, yeah, to approach this uh, problem differently. So here we get a, we're looking at, uh, yeah. Structure again that maybe it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a benchmark problem, so it's not a real structure in this case. Um, but we consider this like a bridge. This is a bridge, and this is actually the case we considered that we have a bridge, and this bridge potentially subject to scour, which is one of the main failure modes of bridge. Um, and we think that we could we can potentially install a monitoring system. So the, the monitoring system different number of sensors, which could be optimized. Um, and again, we need, a, like in all the examples, we need a model of the deterioration process. So this is in the model represented by a stiffness reduction at this support, uh, modeled in this way. We, This different reduction is a function of time and is a stochastic process which considers a kind of a gradual deterioration, gradually, with time. But then we also have these kind of shock events that are basically flood events that can cause larger, larger um, scour deterioration. And this is modeled by compound possibles. So, this is stochastic model here. Um, 
We also consider, because we're interested in the monitoring and we focus, this, this study was to focus a bit on the monitoring system. So we model in more detail the, this, this, this aspect of how do we collect data from the monitoring system. And the monitoring system has the issue that it's subject to environmental variability. So when the temperature changes, for example, stiffness changes and so you're, you're, what you observe changes even though the system is still the same. So we modeled also these factors. I'm not going detail here. So really we have a model of how the, the temperature affects the, the, the Young's models and we also simulate that. So in, in our ground truth simulation model, we can simulate that quite easily um, if we have a model like we have here. And then we, for each point in time, we basically do this uh, procedure where we, at the, on the left here, we generate this ground truth by doing, doing the, with what is the temperature, what is the, what, what is the underlying deterioration that we have, and so on. We get some noisy acceleration time series. And this we give again to the second um, the digital twin that now gets only this noisy time series data and does something called stochastic subspace identification uh, to get eigenfrequencies um, estimated and also corrects for the, corrects basically for temperature effects and so on. Um, so this is what is now done in this second virtual twin, which kind of re re represents what will happen when we have this monitoring system in real life. Now, the, okay, again, we, we actually try to compare the situation with and without monitoring systems. So we look at what do we do if we don't have SHM, then we assume we inspect every five years. And we also inspect after a flood event or when the predicted failure rate exceeds a certain level. And of course, these parameters can be optimized. So if you want, you can optimize the parameters. So we get basically an optimal heuristic without SHM if you want to optimize this. And you see one particular realization again here. So this is basically the realization that we have from when we just have inspection. And we see that the uncertainty is quite large after the inspection is small, but then you get again large uncertainties after the inspection. And this is the same, actually it's the same ground truth so we use the same ground truth, but now we say, okay, what if we have the monitoring system and we do our, our operational model analysis? So we get much better, in this case, much better um, estimates, still not perfect, but much better estimates of our deterioration. And so the failure rate that we estimate is also changing right? and hence, the decision is also changing. So the, the decision threshold is still the same. So we still replace when we have the same probability of failure predicted. But because our estimate changes, also the decision changes. Okay. And now we again, for this particular sample, we can do that now. We can look at what is the difference for this particular sample. But more importantly, we repeat that again for many samples. We get what is the expected life cycle cost for this particular heuristic with the monitoring system and without, and we can calculate the difference, which is the value of information. Yeah. But I, maybe I didn't mention so far is that how do we deal with this low probability of failure that we have with the system? Well, we actually have something like a kind of a fragility model here that we that can be pre-computed. So basically we can or we can calculate the, the, the reliability of the structure in function of how much the deterioration progresses. So conditional on the deterioration, we get the conditional probability of failure. So for each Monte Carlo sample of the ground truth, which reflects the deterioration, we have a conditional probability of failure in, in function of time. And this conditional Monte Carlo is very, easy way of dealing with the small probability of, of failure, which works here very well. That even with this, yeah, the samples in the order of thousands, we can get a good 
estimate of the probability of failure. All right, so this is this example. Um, yeah, this is some details that are not relevant, not important here, but just should be. Yeah, okay, no, I'm not going to details. Yes, so basically, this is how we we we, we do that. Um, this brings me to my last slide, which is main important messages here. Um, this whole problem of inspection and maintenance planning, and I showed examples of structures, but because in, in for infrastructures is essentially the same thing. We have just a system of components that somehow interact. This is a sequential decision problem under uncertainty that has a large, in some sense, intractable computational complexity. We can only find approximate solution. Um, as I said, there are, you can put PUMVP and reinforcement learning in one thing, but essentially there's this, this, this branch of trying to use um, AI, machine learning techniques um, that will need deep learning because otherwise they cannot deal with this complexity. Otherwise, they can solve only simple problems. But in deep, the deep learning, we're getting to we're getting towards more being able to solve more complex problems. Is one possibility. The other one is this approach that I'm presented here, which is kind of using this heuristic, which is easy and relatively and quite effective um, if you find good heuristic rules. And in a combination with the Monte Carlo approach, it's very easy to implement. Uh, one advantage of this approach, I didn't talk about that, is that with respect to the reinforcement learning type of approach, is that it leads directly to explainable strategies. Explainable meaning that an engineer can understand what is the, what is the reasoning or, or why is my algorithm proposing to do now inspections. Right? Because we have rules behind that can be understood. This is quite a benefit in practical application as opposed to the more black box uh, approaches that are the alternatives. I show that there's still, of course, all, there's always issues and, and, and challenges, but I think we can address more, most of them. Maybe the biggest challenge for all these approaches is that we're still in need of better deterioration models. Um, so, surprisingly, there is, you're still very poor in predicting actual deterioration in real life structures. In some systems where we have a lot of data, which is relatively controlled, we have good ideas. But for many systems, this is not the case. And of course, well, now we have many ways of collecting data. Industries have realized the opportunities that lie in collecting data. So hopefully this situation will change and we get a better, we get better deterioration models soon. And because this is really what we need for any of these approaches to, to work. So thanks for listening. Um, I'm still here for some questions. Um, yeah, that uh, if you want to read, some details about what I presented. Here's some ideas where you can find some of those. And uh, yeah, any questions? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Yes, now there are really one question that you can see from the chat box from Benjamin Smith. Can you see that? Yes, I see there's one in the chat. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if, yes, say here, Benjamin Schmidt. Okay. Um, I don't know if he yeah. wants to ask himself or I can also. The first thing, no. Maybe Benjamin yeah, how, wants, for to, wants to yeah. ask a question. Otherwise, I will read it. Yeah. Read um, it so in the... oh, can yeah. somebody, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yes, sorry, my uh, my Bluetooth headphones are a little bit uh, <laughs> messy. Uh, thank you very much for the nice explanations in your presentation.
uh, I've actually two two uh, questions. The first one is uh, in the first example with the mass and the optimal number of components to be expected. Um, I wondered how do you uh, um, handle the other effects like wind, uh, wind and snow? Uh, do do you take uh, data or uh, do you uh, derive the distribution from standards? You you know what I want to to yeah, ask? Yeah. No, no. Yes. Um, well, first of all, so maybe I should clarify this was actually a kind of an offshore uh, structure, but it, 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 I mean the question can be transferred, so it's, it's the same type of issue. So what, what what do we do with loads on the structure um, and the they i mean the well it depends um actually for the offshore structures they were based on on site specific load models um, but of course you basically try to get the best probabilistic model um that you have uh, that you can get in the time that you have available no? so that's always the issue no? so what what you use what you can uh, maybe I should also clarify that the load model actually enters in two ways here in this example. Um, one way is that the load will determine the the fatigue, to, uh, well, basically it's an input to the fatigue uh, model. And here in the example, the, it's an input to the fatigue model. And the the second is that the load so. Even if you have a failure of fatigue failure locally, the, the structure is redundant, highly redundant actually. So it doesn't fail directly. It will fail under a, an extreme environmental load. It's just more likely to fail if it has already some fatigue failures. So it enters in two ways. Um, but basically, we we, we used in for offshore structures, there are quite good probabilistic models for load actually available. Yeah. What we did not use, however, is um, actually recorded load history. So, so basically, if you improve this further, you could consider that you also collect data on loads um, and use that to improve your, your decision making even more. This is not considered. Here. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe <laughs> when, I, when, when I still get you, uh, my second yeah. question is, uh, is it possible or uh, uh, is it, uh, can you uh, uh, catch the dependencies from the individual inspections? Uh, I mean, uh, when the same persons perform the same inspections uh, with the same equipment or? Yeah, well, yes and no. Actually, it's possible to model this. I think my long time ago, I did a, a study where I investigated exactly this, how, how this affects, I have a paper where I just looked at how this dependence correlation would, would affect the, the resulting kind of reliability and inspection plan. Um, the, the problem is more that we don't really have much information about this. So um, we are even we're lucky if we get a, models on inspection performance in general um, and get models about how what is the dependence uh, between like if the same inspector performs, like if the same, we know that okay, if the same inspector performs multiple inspections, uh, the, that inspector is more experienced or somehow in a better sh shape uh, that day, or if the conditions generally are better, like if you think of these offshore structure, you know, that if underwater inspections, so depending on the, 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 the conditions, maybe the inspection could be better or worse. So yeah. this, this is things that can be included in the framework if you know them I mean, without much additional it's not, it doesn't add to the complexity of the problem, but we don't really have models for these things. Um, so we could make some guesses. Um, yeah. But yeah, of course it does affect a bit. Um, yeah, but this is something that typically we neglect because we don't have the information. But if you have information about this, we can include it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Thanks, Stephen. One more question. Um, thanks, Professor Daniel, and thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a small question regarding the Monte Carlo simulation of the structure to predict this reliability and the failure probability. 
because we know that when the uh, failure probability is low, we always need a large number of Monte Carlo simulations. And this always require a large computational cost. And yes. I'm a little, yes, and, uh, and Professor Daniel, do you consider these dynamic loadings such as window loadings? Because for this um, time history analysis, it is always for a single computation. It is always require a lot of time so if you need like, for example, 10,000 simulations, it will need a such a long time. So how do you handle this problem? Yes, thank Thanks. you. Yes, I mean, I say maybe I was not uh, sufficiently clear about what we do with this and what tried to explain, but it's good that you ask. Um, so you're right, of course, if I just want, if I want to compute Monte with Monte, just a simple Monte Carlo approach, a probability of failure of 10 to the minus, let's say five, one in a hundred thousand, I would need roughly whatever, 10, one, one to 10, 10 million samples. So, so I'm, if I'm using only 1,000 samples in my kind of analysis here, most likely I will not observe any failure of the structure. Um, so what do we do? What we do is we do, and actually, if you look at you know this, this famous book of uh, Rubinstein that deals with Monte Carlo methods, very recommendable. You go there somewhere. I think it's so he calls it conditional Monte Carlo. You find it there. Really. So basically, what we do is we find the conditional pr probability of failure. For example, in this example here, we look at okay, what happens if we have different combinations of failures, for example, no number of, of failures in, this, in, in, in the structure, or, and we pre-compute, before we do this analysis, we pre-compute what is the condition of probability of failure given that certain components have failed. Or in the second example, the same, we basically look at the, the, the bridge and we say, okay, if this iteration at the mid-span has a certain level, what is the probability of failure? And then we change this level and we pre-compute the probability of failure. And this we can do with more advanced simulation, not, not just, this we do ideally not in Monte Carlo, but maybe with more advanced reliability analysis methods, like well, you know them maybe, but you know, cross entropy or form, if you can use it or substance simulation, et cetera. But we pre-compute that. Um, and then when we do the, the, the simulation of the, the time history, and then you could also, if you want it, you could also do even dynamic analysis. We, we don't go in these details. We use a relatively simple uh, pushover in this case, for example, pushover failure models. Um, but even they are also dynamic. They also require some computation. And so we do relatively simple reliability analysis, but we, we, we pre-compute that so that we have given a certain system condition, what is the probability of failure? And that could be that if the system is in this in this condition, for example, if it's in perfect condition, it might be 10 to the minus six. If we have one failure, maybe it's 10 to the minus five. Maybe if we have two or three failures, we have 10 to the minus four. And then we, we still get a, a risk estimate, even if we have, even if in our, in our simulation, we do not actually have a, an actual failure. Okay, but this is how we do that here. Yeah. Okay. I see that there are some more questions in the chat. I, maybe somebody, but I, 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 maybe somebody can, you know, because but I think that the people, this recorded also, and the people who, who uh, are listening in the recording will not see the chat, so maybe, I think. Who wants to ask a question? In the chat? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, uh, I, 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 I can read up this question. Uh, okay. Uh, or mm -hmm. if. Uh, right, okay, is, I know if somebody. If, uh, is Giddy on there? Yes, yes, yes. I'm here. I'm just... Okay, then go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, thank you, Daniel. Uh, this is Gideon. Um, I'm a, currently I'm a, a working in um, KAUST, King Abdullah University in, uh, of uh, Science and Technology uh, in Saudi Arabia. 
So I just have a really, really general question about the hazard and risk analysis. So uh, according to my knowledge, risk analysis should be largely based on hazard level and uh, some consequence model, uh, et cetera. So I just want to know uh, what's your opinion about how we deal with hazard when we perform the risk analysis? Thank you. Mm, okay, I'm not sure uh, exactly. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure exactly what, 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 where your direction, where your question points to, but uh, maybe I'll try to answer and then you say it. I answered properly. Um, I mean, classically, risk is measured by uh, expected expected loss. So, me meaning uh, we have a cost of failure. And, or if we have multiple failure states, each of these has a cost, and we have a, a probability of that these events happen. And then calculate expected value, the probability times consequence, gives us the risk. And, um, well, the probability that the failure happens is, of course, determined or influenced at least strongly by the hazard. So, in this case, the hazard is deterioration. Um, if you think of more like natural hazards, like earthquake, um, that can be kind of like leading to deterioration also. So that that, that is um, so 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 so, so the, the hazard will will, will, will will influence the probability and therefore will influence the risk automatically. But I'm not sure that answers your question now. Or... Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I see that somebody asked. Uh, okay, I'm now reading also the, myself. So there's somebody asks the Pratik um, Pustali. Ah, oh, you sent me a direct message. Somebody can see that. Okay, somebody asked me the direct message. Uh, uh, I will read it for that because it's a good question. But um, I was wondering if it's possible to learn new heuristics from deep reinforcement learning approaches similar to how we learn new strategies from deep reinforcement learning agents playing Mission chess. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, this is something that we were currently investigating in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a research project that we just started, where we basically look at this. So we try to see, okay, can we extract heuristics, explainable heuristics from deep reinforcement learning solutions? So um, if we look maybe a bit more at starting to look at a bit more complex systems where it's not so obvious what would be good heuristics huh? like when you play chess or go um then we, we could run a deep reinforcement learning approach and then see if we can so we have to think about how to do that exactly extract extract um, strategies that, that heuristic strategies that somehow approximate the deep reinforcement learning solution or at least in some ways you can get insights into what could be optimal heuristics. Yeah, it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, hi, Professor. I, I'm Professor, uh, thank you for your fantastic presentation. Uh, just as you, uh, as you said that uh, inspection and maintenance inspection planning is a sequential decision problem. Uh, each time you unite, uh, uh, but uh, in some case, each time you unite some operation information can also be ob uh, obtained, like the uh, structural state or just uh, like this uh, uh, structure is the web. Uh, we could also use this information to update the uh, future probability of failure in this case. And uh, furthermore, uh, in the case of obtaining SHM information, uh, this information could be very beneficial for updating prior knowledge. So I'm just wondering uh, what frequency of for changing prior planning based on this information can be regarded as a feasible choice. Uh, and uh, okay. also, yeah, and also if we update the decision every unit, uh, unit time, uh, I mean that uh, the uh, quantification of value of information in this case 
uh, could be very uh, computational challenging. So I have these two. Uh, I have these two questions. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your nice words. Um, well, actually, at least with with um, the approach I presented, the the number of time units is not a big issue. So, in this in this infection example, though this the second example that I presented at the end, where we look at the, the health monitoring system SHM, we consider that okay, we had kind of a, one summary. We had a, we had a kind of a data point every year, but we could also consider that this data comes every month or even every every week or every day. Um, okay, we got, well, I should say that we have information every year and then we had additional information whenever a flood event occurred. So whenever a flood event occurs, we assume that in this particular point in time, we have also specific information. Um, but in principle, we could consider it almost every day, every day to have uh, new information. Well, it makes computation a bit more expensive, but not drastically because um, you see that the, 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 the decisions when we use this heuristic approach, when we do the simulation, the decision is described by the policies that are given because we have a fixed W. So we have a fixed uh, set of heuristic parameters that describe, that, that fix our policies. So we are really simulating the ground truth and that simulation, yeah, of course, if you have to simulate for every day, you get a few, you get a bit bigger vectors, you have a bit more data, but, it's not difficult, and we basically check our decision rule every day. Again, that's not computationally intensive. Um, because if you do a here, if we do a, if you consider if we do a, a new operational model analysis every day, this this would be a this would be a bit more expensive. So that's maybe computationally a bit more expensive, but it's not something that is let's say intractable. It's been still possible. Um, so, yes, we are quite limited, we got quite free with, 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 with making our time intervals smaller. Of course, it doesn't make much sense to consider time intervals when in, where in practice nobody would make a decision. So, nobody's going to look at this every day uh, and make a new decision every day, should I do something or not. Okay. At best, what is done in practice is that you put a threshold on certain parameters. And you let it run the system, and then you see, okay, if this threshold is exceeded, then somebody goes and looks at the system. Should we do something about it? Um, so we could check every day for this threshold, and if that's exceeded, then you do some more analysis in, in your simulation. Yeah, and therefore also the calculation of VUI. I mean, here we said we have fifty time instances plus these individual time instances when floods occur. Um, where we do decisions and well, it's not, it doesn't make it more difficult to compute the valid information on that. So in that sense, the approach is, does not have this complexity that, that, that we have if we try to get the full solution. Thank you, thank you, yes. Professor. Yeah. But if you're interested in this, uh, yeah, if you're interested in this, um, oops, sorry. Here, this is described in this paper here by Antonis Tamariotis. Now we do exactly that. Okay. All right. Okay. I I, I think it may, may it may be the uh, second one. Is that right? Second one. Up to uh, the second paper here. Yeah. 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 It's, yes. uh, yeah, well, you... this one, but also the, the, the second to last is Camariot, is, uh, where we do the health monitoring uh, ah, application. Yeah. This yeah. isn't this Camariot's paper. The general approach is best explained in the, in the second paper, yes. Maybe I should highlight this second paper here is the one which explains this general approach the yeah. best. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Yes. And by the way, if you're looking for a Paper that, look, that that looks at modeling inspection and, and, and probabilistically modeling of inspection. Then the third paper is uh, the one I would recommend. 
Um, okay, enough commercial. Good. Uh, the, uh, Michael had to leave, I see. So I will take over the money, the, the moderation. But is there um, remaining questions? From the audience? Um, Okay, I have one more question if the, I see in the chat. Uh, I'm curious if the heuristic approach can be used to solve multi-objective problems. Um, you know, I guess, in principle, yes, of course, but uh, the, 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 the challenge with multi-objective problem is that, so you, you, you basically have to get more like something like a Pareto front. Huh? So you have to get to a Pareto front rather than to a single solution. So, and um, yes, uh, yeah, we, we did not think too much about this so far. Um, so I can't really say much more than that. I, mean, I have not actually seen people doing maintenance or maybe I missed it, but I'm not seeing people doing maintenance optimization with, with multi-objective type of problems. And, it, and personally, I also think that it's probably limited use uh, because typically prefer to have a single solution rather than a parade up front. But yeah, I guess it's something to investigate. Okay. All right. Uh, if there's no more questions, last opportunity for a last question. Uh, probably I can ask last one. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, Professor Danny. Just on time. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm Xin Yujia, and I did my PhD with Professor Kostas Papadimche. So I'm also a Beijing guy. Uh, in slide 14, probably slide 14 or 15, something like that, uh, you mentioned this digital twin. Uh, I wonder, I'm just wondering the difference between this popular word digital twin and the uh, model updating. As I understand, it's the digital twin, twin is like a sequential updating. So when you have the data one time and you update the model, and if the model predictions are not exact with the measurements, then you use another data to do this sequential uh, updating. And finally, you get the digital twin model and it's a representation of the physical model. I mean, this is just my understanding. I'm not sure if it's, this is correct or not. So I wonder your opinion or comments on the difference between the digital twin and the uh, sequential uh, model updating. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, think, I, I honestly, I don't have such a precise definition of digital twin. I mean, the, as I said in the past, we, I just, or oh, not just me, other people also just called this a um, model. And uh, yeah, now we want to be a bit more fancy, so we call it digital twin. <laughs> um, since the but and essentially, I think what the um, sequential model updating is already a bit, maybe a bit more precise. But but basically, the the model updating is more is, is more like the process. The process. So the digital twin is is a, is a representation that I have of my real system, a model if you want, and this model has. So the structure, it has certain parameters. And when I do sequential model updating, I'm trying to learn the parameters of this model using the data. And I continuously improve this. So for me, the sequential model updating is it's like the process of obtaining an, the best kind of parameter estimates. So and then, which means like this is a process of, of learning my digital twin. And this digital twin is continuously evolving in time. You know? So in some sense, the one on the the one on the left is kind of the, the where we simulate the future ground through. So, okay, this this is how the future could evolve. And if you simulate basically one. But then the the one on the right here is the one that we using this one on the left, we generate a time series of data that we say, okay, and for this, we actually need also the, the, the monitoring or inspection model. Okay, if this is the ground truth, 
and how it evolves in the future. Then what what is a, what is a realization? What is a possible realization of what of what we will observe? And this is the data that we generate here below. And this data is then given to the second model here, or the second model. And here, in some sense, we do this, or we can use different techniques, but we do, we do model, sequential model updating, so where we sequentially get more and more data, and we sequentially change this digital twin by continuously updating our model parameters with data that comes gradually. So this data here comes gradually. And this okay, is continuously see, updated. Okay, but this is—it's also good that you uh, allowed me to explain this in a bit more. <laughs> and then, this is used to this. This is used in the heuristic to decide, and also with other, uh, but in other approaches. But this has been used to decide which action to take. So, in the right left hand side, we from the beginning we have kind of the the, the, the full time history, the exact, uh, what we for the whole. There's no updating. But on the right-hand side, we get the data gradually and we continuously update our digital twin or our model um, with some process, sequential model update. Okay, I got it, thank you. Yep, thanks for asking. And say hello to Costas. <laughs> uh, yeah, I <anyway. laughs> Good. All right, so thanks a lot for all the interesting uh, questions. And I um, see that yes, it is recorded. Good. And I hope to see many of you in some other occasion. And yeah, thanks for listening. Yes, yeah, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, we are looking forward yeah, to thanks. meet you again. Yes. Yes, actually, I actually have to go to another meeting. So. <laughs> thanks for no. I took your time, but uh, great. Thanks for organizing and for inviting me. And uh, okay, see you, Daniel. See you soon. See you. See you. Bye. See you. Have a nice Bye. day. Bye. Nice day. Yes.